Good evening all. Uh, I'm Simon Skelton. I'm the Platform and Operations Manager at John Lewis and Partners. Uh, that means I've got overall accountability for the smooth running of JohnLewis.com website. Um, I consider myself a new boy at the partnership with a mere 20 years. Uh, and throughout my career, I've been an on-call programmer, developer, led up teams and implemented ITIL across the partnership. But I'm definitely an advocate for DevOps. And I'm Steve Smith. I'm a principal consultant at Equal Experts. I've worked with them and for them for seven years. And I recently spent two and a half years working with Simon at John Lewis on You Build It, You Run It, Continuous Delivery, Operability, and a whole bunch of other good stuff. Um, I used to be an organizer of London CD when it first started. So it's great to uh, be, uh, come back. And thanks to Daniel and Nirvana for inviting us. Really appreciate it. And um, so we're here to talk about operability and You Build It, You Run It at John Lewis and Partners and how we've gone from 10 releases a year to 5,000 deployments a year, whilst also improving website stability. But first, let me give you a little bit of background for John Lewis, that, those that don't know us, and a bit of context on the retail market. So this is definitely not John Lewis. For those of us old enough to know, this is the classic Are You Being Served sitcom from the 70s and 80s. But actually, our history goes much further back than that. So our heritage starts uh, back in 1864 when John Lewis Sr. opened the first store in Oxford Street. But it was actually his son pictured here, John Speed and Lewis, who believed in fairness and humanity. And he experimented with a new business model as he thought it was unfair that the three owners and more than all of the 300 employees put together. And way back in 1920, he shared the first bonus of seven weeks pay with everybody. Um, so you'll see in the middle, for those that don't know, John Lewis Partnership is the overarching brand. We have John Lewis and Partners, the department store side of the business, and Waitrose and Partners um, is the supermarket grocery chain. Um, so these strong foundations have still allowed us to adapt and innovate. And you can see over the top right there, Edgar the Dragon was our first combined John Lewis and Waitrose uh, Christmas ad advert, often called the official start of Christmas, and that was trending uh, number one on UK Twitter within two minutes of launch, so very popular. And as you see at the bottom, our stores continue to be updated to meet their ever-changing customer needs with more focus on experiences, um, and indeed, they've had to change. So looking back at 2019 was a very challenging year for retail, uh, with the likes of big brands like Mothercare closing down. As we were chatting about earlier, unbelievably, Brexit is no longer, you know, taking over the headlines. It's all about coronavirus. Um, and, you know, other well-known brands, High Street Stores, Debenhams, House of Fraser's had to close too. You see the figure on the right there, almost 10,000 stores closed in 2020. So it's a, it's a very, uh, you know, competitive uh, market to, to stay alive. But uh, let's look at some positives. So here's a great example of how we quickly adapted. So we had our virtual services launched in just two weeks after the first lockdown forced our shops to close. So we had virtual nursery, personal styling, home design, beauty classes, all proving really, really popular. Uh, and that's something that we think will likely continue post coronavirus. And also coronavirus has really accelerated what we believe will be a permanent shift to more online. So JohnLewis.com was already pretty successful at about 40% of total sales, but this is likely now to remain at the 60 to 70% mark, we believe. Uh, here's a graph uh, which is showing Black Friday, which is normally our biggest day online. And of course, last Black Friday, our shops were closed once again. Uh, and uh, I'm pleased with our estimate proved very accurate. We uh, saw a plus 50% additional increase in sales on the previous Black Friday. But even more importantly, I'm pleased to say that our three-year investment paid off. The platform scaled perfectly, traded well throughout the whole of Black Friday and the whole Christmas period, and we traded without any issues. So that, that's just a bit of context. Um, but let's jump back to 2017, which was a critical decision point on our journey. So back in 2017, we felt our speed to market for new features was too slow. And the technology was seen as constraining us instead of enabling the business. It was also difficult to manually scale the on-premise servers for the likes of Black Friday. 
as well as difficult to add more teams to work simultaneously, working on delivering new features for our customers. Also, this was a key decision point because we had to decide whether we invested the 18, next 18 months of budget and the majority of our resources in upgrading our commercial off-the-shelf e-commerce package. And that would only enable us to stay in support without adding any new customer-facing features. So, spoiler alert, that's not the option we chose. Um, back in 2017, we had six teams working on multiple e-commerce monoliths. So, there was the e-commerce package I talked about, but we'd also tried to go for headless e-commerce and build actually bespoke from ends, which turned into other monoliths, uh, which really still constrained us. We had a central operations team called App Application Operations Support, and this mostly comprised of a third party managed service with a few partners as we um, call ourselves. Um, we managed one overnight deploy a month. So by the time you've done a change freeze for our Christmas sale and our summer sale, that was only 10 deploys a year. And these big releases as well caused plenty of major incidents and uh, we had quality issues as well. Uh, and we, and we you know, believe we were losing millions of pounds a year in opportunity costs. Um, we couldn't release new features fast enough. So let's now talk about what we did to tackle those challenges. So this is a timeline, a brief narrative of a huge amount of work by lots of people. And we can't cover everything today, so we'll just cover some key points. So late in 2017, we made that commitment to replace our monolith with digital services while still delivering new features in parallel to our customers. So those digital services were run on what we call the John, John Lewis digital platform. It provides a paved road and it's a bespoke platform capability that built on top of the Google Cloud platform. And this allows us to scale up product teams without compromising on throughput quality and reliability. By 2018, our cloud search team was successfully taking 1% of all live traffic away from our old e-commerce search engine. And this validated not only the technology, but the ways of working as well. Step forward then to 2019, we had nine times as many teams. We had product teams on call for their own services and we had new customer propositions emerging. And by Black Friday 2020, we continue to grow and accelerate moving significant traffic away from our monolith to the new services, which as you saw, allowed those record levels of uh, trade on Black Friday. So back in 2017, we believed that product teams and you build it, you run it were prerequisites for daily deployments and higher reliability. But in the 2000s, we actually had combined delivery and ops teams, but they were eventually split as delivery deadlines were frequently missed as operational issues became overwhelming for those teams. But what were these issues that we could learn from? Well, back then we had project-based delivery with infrequent business order input. And we now have agile product teams with frequent prioritization from a product owner. We had manual testing, with free, uh, with, uh, which didn't catch enough defects. We now have automated testing with continuous integration. Releases were infrequent, large, and manual. We now have continuous delivery with small, frequent deployments. And on-premise test and live environments were too slow to provision and often varied from test to live. And now we have the John Lewis digital platform for cloud-based self-service infrastructure. But when it came to operability, keeping availability high and operational issues low, the question I kept asking myself and Steve was how do you embed operability into digital teams at scale in an organization that's 150 years old? So, forward. So we brought down operability into these four areas. So growing awareness by making product teams responsible for supporting their own live digital services, identifying concerns by standardizing and then visualizing both leading and trailing indicators, testing the proficiency by running chaos days and live load tests, and embedding principles by creating new learning pathways and opportunities for our employees or partners, as we call them. 
And now I'll hand over to Steve to give you some more details on these. Thanks, Simon. So I always describe an operating model as insurance for business outcomes. And you build it, you run it as an insurance policy, just like having a central operations team. And the difference with you build it, you run it is that you can achieve higher standards of deployment throughput and service reliability. And it can be done in a way that's cost effective at scale. So this table here shows um, the how you build it, you run it works at uh, John Lewis and Partners. We're showing revenue levels tied to availability levels tied to on-call levels. So the way it works is that, let's say a product manager has an idea for a new digital service and they want to run that digital service when it's being built on the John Lewis and Partners digital platform. There's an onboarding guide. The very first page of the onboarding guide has a section just for product managers and it has a version of this table. And what it asks the product managers to do is to estimate how much revenue will flow through their digital service in a given hour on a common trading day. And based on that, they uh, input that number into a magic spreadsheet that myself and a uh, partner wrote. And then that spits out the availability target that you're given and the out of hours support level that you'll have. So for example, if I'm wanting to build a cloud search service, I might want to uh, think um, it's gonna have a million pounds flowing through in an hour. That's equivalent to 570,000 in 43 minutes. 43 minutes you might know comes from 99.9. Three nines mean you're allowed 43 minutes of downtime in a month. So if you believe that your service could lose 570,000 pounds in 43 minutes or less, then you are told this is your availability target and you will have a team rotor. On the other hand, if I'm thinking about like a general merchandising service, and my estimate is that if it's down for between one and seven hours, I'd lose 50,000 pounds or more, then I'd get 99.0% and I'd be told there'd be no on call. And we'll come back to those different on call levels in a moment. So the most important part here is that it's a product manager that makes decisions, not a platform operations manager like Simon, not a digital platform lead like myself. Um, it's important that a product manager makes decisions because they're the budget holder for a service. They're the ones that prioritize work in the team, operational features versus product features. So Simon talked at the start about having overall accountability for the JohnLewis.com website. What one of the many great things Simon's done in the uh, three years I've known him is to push responsibility for on call for those digital services onto those product managers in a way that's constructive. So this um, is a framework that works well for John Lewis and partners. It's not a recipe. Um, the revenue levels that you tie to the availability levels, the availability levels you're tied to the on call levels, that will really vary based on your organization, your business need, you might have some kind of software running in your organization that needs four nines, in which case that's totally fine. We couldn't find anything in the John Lewis partnership that needed um, the amount of engineering effort necessary to achieve four nines. Three nines is considered what uh, you needed for critical services in John Lewis and partners. Oh, and one more point I should make on this actually. Uh, that's okay, Simon, thank you. Um, the initial revenue levels there, you may be wondering where they came from. They came from a partnership-wide policy paper on instant management and expected revenue losses. So we took that as our starting point and then we iterated on that over time. Um, okay, so this is a uh, visualization of how instant notifications workflow, uh, instant, no instant notifications work um, at John Lewis and Partners. At the top, we have monolith alerts for the existing on-premise e-commerce applications. And underneath, we have alerts for digital services running on the John Lewis and Partners digital platform. So at the top, a monolith would have an alert come out of New Relic. It would be fired into the OpsBridge team who would manually like scrabble around in a bunch of spreadsheets, find the on-call rotor for the app support team, find the person on call on that team, and then give them a phone call. They'd invite that engineer into a Google chat room. They'd then pull in a major instant manager and then instant response can begin in that chat room. Or the OpsBridge team member would also manually create a record in ServiceNow, which is the um, uh, system of truth in John Lewis and Partners, and everything to do with the incident would be recorded in that record. With digital services, it's very different. Um, an alert might come out of Prometheus for a microservice, it might come out of New Relic for a front end, and both of them are automatically pushed into PageDuty. PageDuty is automatically provisioned with teams, services, escalation policies, and rotors that all comes out of the digital platform. So if when you start a service, you tell JLDP what, what your availability target will be, what your team name is, 
and then uh, JLDP talks to PagerDuty and provisions everything for you. So then from there, PagerDuty can match the alert to a service, match the service to a team, match the team to a policy and to a on-call rotor. They then autom that then automatically uh, calls the app or makes a phone call to an engineer on a product team uh, that has PagerDuty installed on their phone. Um, there's an automatic record created in ServiceNow, and there's bi-directional sync between PagerDuty and ServiceNow, which is really nice because that means any changes made in ServiceNow are reflected back in PagerDuty and vice versa. An incident channel is created in Slack, which is public and searchable. And also the product engineers have a big shiny button that we created in PagerDuty that says declare a major incident. And if you push that, that looks up the major incident manager rotor and calls a major incident manager and invites them into the right Slack channel. So the incident management process itself hasn't changed. We've just got a much faster way of getting hold of them. So on reflection, adding an automated incident response tool like PagerDuty, it made a huge difference in our operability journey at John Lewis and Partners uh, for a whole bunch of different reasons. It meant that the time to acknowledge an incident came down from five to 20 minutes to under 60 seconds, because obviously there's no one manually looking up an on-call number. Um, if somebody on the product team doesn't answer the phone, PageDuty will then ring the next person. So all of those kind of little problems, all that friction has been taken away. Also, all of the setup around PageDuty, around ServiceNow, which is a personal favorite of mine, that all that friction has been taken away. So we're making it as easy as possible for teams to do, you build it, you run it. Um, it also meant that a commitment to working with all of IT operations could be demonstrated because there was no attempt to create a separate process for instant management. When I now talk to other companies, aside from John Lewis and Partners, and they say to me, how will instant management work when you build it, you run it? I like to say exactly the same way as before. It doesn't have to change. All we're doing is removing friction around inviting those folks into instant response and using their skills and knowledge. And also this approach meant that anybody could observe an incident because the Slack channel was public and searchable. So any interested parties could watch the incident unfold. And that channel was also used as one of the inputs into the post incident review process. Uh, yeah, let's move on please, Simon. Thank you. Okay, so this diagram shows uh, out of our support for digital services at John Lewis and Partners in early 2020. The Y axis is availability targets from low to high and the x-axis is customer demand from low to high. So I mentioned previously that different digital services have different levels of on-call. And that's because we have striven really hard to balance operability incentives with cost effectiveness at scale. On paper, uh, it would be lovely <laughs> to have 20 people in 20 different teams with 20 different services to be on-call, but obviously that's not cost effective. At the same time, we know that we don't want to have one person on call for 20 services because then we're repeating the operations team pattern, which isn't what we want. So there's a balance to strike here. And we want to do that in a way that doesn't water down operability incentives. We don't want developers thinking it's okay, there's an ops team that's a safety net, so I don't have to worry about this. So the way it works is that if your digital service has one of the lower availability targets, there is no on call. And when I say no on call, I mean there is no operations team fallback we designed the digital platform and its processes in a way that you can't actually fall back to the ops team. There's no route to do that. And that's really important because that actually strengthens operability incentives for the product teams in the daytime, because they know that if, I don't know, the appointment service, if that has any issues overnight, those issues will remain there until the morning and then the engineers will have to deal with it in the morning, okay? So we've seen stronger incentives for developers than if we were to say there's no one called and an ops team kind of keeps half an eye on it. The moment you tell developers, in my experience, and I was a developer for a long time, uh, if you tell them someone's got half an eye on this, what you actually hear is, this is taken care of for me. I, you know, I can party, it's totally fine. All right, so with a middling availability target, um, a service goes into a product domain rotor. That means a product team engineer would be on call for their digital services, or a engineer from a sibling product team in, a, in the same product domain. A product domain is a logical grouping of digital services with a similar affinity. So an example here on the diagram is commercial journeys. There's the concept at John Lewis and Partners of a commercial journeys domain. And inside that there are digital services like add to basket, electricals and fashion. So that's three different teams 
three different digital services with one on-call rotor. And tonight there'll be somebody on call from those three teams, but only one of them. Okay, so this is how we try to achieve cost effectiveness without watering down incentives. And product domain rotors are used specifically to encourage a focus on customer outcomes and minimize cognitive load. We discarded other ideas like geographic domains or um, delivery center domains, like having a customer domain rotor, excuse me, a product domain rotor is a way of really keeping people thinking about customers. And finally, if a digital service has the highest availability target, uh, only three of them here, Cloud Search, the platform itself, and Browse Assembly, then what happens is that that has a team rotor and the team themselves are entirely on call. So this is where we have maximum operability incentives for our highest availability target, um, and the team operates their own schedule entirely on their own. A team rotor itself isn't forever. If and when a product manager decides that product demand has been filled, at least for that point in time, then uh, as customer demand slows down, the digital service will transition back into its logical product domain rotor. So for example, the cloud search service here belongs to a product domain rotor uh, called findability. It might eventually slide back into that domain rotor when demand has filled. And then of course, one day it might move back into a team rotor if demand increases. So this is another way to achieve cost savings in a way that doesn't discourage developers from focusing on operational features as well as product features in a way that you can protect daily deployments and uh, that high standard of availability. Uh, let's see, yep, let's move on please, Simon. All right, so uh, moving on from growing awareness, um, the second point that Simon was around identifying concerns around operability. And right from the outset, Simon was really clear <laughs> that it wasn't enough to have really great automated trailing indicators of success around operability and delivery. We had to have leading indicators. We had to have those a, like a collection of weak signals in advance so we can understand when teams are sliding in the wrong direction. So this is a screenshot of the service catalog. That's a bespoke in-house service running on the John Lewis and Partners digital platform. And it contains information on all of the teams, all of the services, the services availability, and also some leading indicators. So two are shown here, assessments and telemetry. So telemetry is the easy one. Uh, there are a series of automated checks that are performed on every digital service. And if any particular check is failed, then it shows up here in red as a number, as an outstanding task. And one of the checks that happens is, does this digital service have any bespoke telemetry? Has the team created any custom dashboards, custom, uh, logging, uh, custom logs or custom alerts? And the reason we have that um, leading indicator is the digital platform gives every team and every service a lot of high quality logging, monitoring and alerting out of the box. But we've observed that teams that build their own bespoke telemetry on top of that standard are better equipped to deal with live incidents. So when a team or a digital service has no bespoke telemetry at all, we flag that up as a conversation needs to happen. and Maybe there's some work to do there. With the assessments column, this is looking much more open-ended exploratory questions. So if you think about the difference in testing between automated checks and exploratory testing, in assessments, we're looking at things that can't easily be automated. Each quarter, a team fills out an operability self-assessment where they answer a bunch of questions. The um, answers that they give are put into a machine-readable uh, JSON file, I think. And then that's read in by JLDP. It goes into the service catalog. And any tasks that are identified by JIRA ID are visualized here in this assessments column. So for example, green here means there's been a recent assessment and there are no tasks to complete. Gray with an exclamation mark means that there's an overdue assessment. And red means that there's been an assessment and there are some outstanding tasks. And there's a platform team at John Lewis and Partners an enablement team that will follow up with teams and ask if they'd like any help um, completing some of these tasks. Uh, the questions themselves are not yes, no questions. Those ones are automated. Uh, anything where you can just say, you know, is does this thing exist? You know, you can automate that. But in the assessment, all of the questions are how questions. So one example question would be, how do you handle uh, latency problems from a downstream dependency? And that's just in getting the team to think harder about ways to protect their service from problems. And if their answer is, oh, we, we haven't done anything yet there, we need a circuit breaker, then they'd add that as a task 
with a Jira ID into the, into the uh, machine readable answer file. And then that would show up here in the catalog afterwards. All right, and now we look, we're looking at trailing indicators. You might be more familiar with these. Um, so we look at a whole bunch of different trailing indicators around availability rate, time to restore, and also deployment throughput. So this is a screenshot from the catalog where we are visualizing the frequency of deployments by different service and the amount of time it takes to do a deployment. So from this graph, we can see on the red line that this service has gone from fortnightly deployments in 2019 to weekly deployments in 2020. That's, that's nice. We're actually getting down towards daily there, which is really encouraging. But from the blue line, we can see some wobbles around lead time. We can see that some deployments are taking some time to complete. So that, you know, there's a conversation to have there with that team because we know that um, small frequent releases are going to increase adaptive capacity. We're going to be more confident that a team can handle an incident because there'll be a smaller space to diagnose and a smaller space to uh, roll back on. Uh, back to you, Simon. Thank you. So one way we test operability proficiency is by running chaos days. We want to identify the digital services that may fail in production under certain conditions before a major incident actually occurs. So this is a photo from one of our chaos day reviews in our head office where you'll see uh, Rob or the back of the head of Rob Hornby, our platform product owner, playing back the outcomes of a chaos day. That particular one was targeted at the platform itself. It was in a test environment and some of the platform team members were acting of, as agents of chaos, which they really enjoy. Um, product teams were asked to monitor their own services in that test environment and contact the platform team in their dedicated front door Slack channel if they saw any issues. So we run chaos days on a quarterly basis and we intentionally select the most experienced team members to be those agents of chaos. This ensures that they can't act as those human run books during an incident response. Um, and we've uncovered plenty of latent faults in the past, such as a product team who didn't notice that their database had vanished. Um, and the le learnings from a chaos day and follow-up tasks are always captured. And then we've observed that teams who fix the faults soon after those chaos days tend to be less likely to endure painful live incidents later on. We also regularly validate our ability to handle full Black Friday load levels. We have a similar approach to that of our chaos days. We visualize the key components of the website and use our knowledge and experience to determine what those load scenarios are that we want to try. Although the product teams do their own load testing per service, we still find it extremely useful to do simulations of Black Friday extreme levels uh, of, of how customers browse the uh, website and interact and that surfaces the issues. And that's particularly, it's the different interactions between the different components that kind of surface during that. A live load test normally happens overnight to reduce the risk of, of customer impact. Um, but real profiles of customer behavior uh, are captured and then skewed and compressed to fit our Black Friday traffic profile. So they're injected back into the live website Product teams then use the analysis from that live load test to improve their own digital service, which obviously ultimately protects our Black Friday capacity. We also take professional development of our partners very seriously too. After all, they're co-owners in our business. From the very outset of our digital journey, we've ensured that partners have the opportunities to learn new skills and move into new roles. So partner engineers can embark on a number of different learning pathways. We've de designed one specific for operability that covers topics such as agile operations, security testing, performance, learning from incidents, and so on. And we mentioned before that the Apple Pop support team was mostly staffed by third party money service with a few partners. So those partners have invaluable skills and experience. And as we wind down that Apple Pop support team and reduce the managed service, those partners on that team are gradually moving into product teams as well as into the platform team itself to share their operational wisdom and to learn new skills as well. So now I'll hand back to Steve to talk about some of the outcomes we've achieved. Thank you. Okay, so 
let's talk about um, the IT outcomes in terms of deployment throughput and service reliability to begin with. So in terms of deployment throughput, the graph on the left here shows um, frequency of deployment every month between 2018 and the start of 2021. And you can see that John Lewis has rocketed up from 10 a year to 5,000 a year, from monthly to daily. Um, it's an astonishing change. There is a dip here uh, for November 2019 that coincides with Black Friday 2019. And that's because in that year, digital services still fitted into a partnership-wide change management policy for peak. What's happened now in successive years is that there's sufficient stakeholder confidence from Simon and other um, senior folks at John Lewis, the digital services have been lifted out of that process, which is fantastic. The graph on the right here is from the service catalog again. It's showing a list of services. It's showing their time to onboard. It's showing their time to first life customer and their current status. And the time to first customer has come down now from months to 90 days. The time to provision new service is down from, I think, six months to one day now. Um, and some services are reaching the first life customer in under a week and reporting additional millions per year in incremental revenue as a result. All right, so this shows service reliability. The graph on the left shows the rate of major incidents uh, between 2018 and 2020. And you'll see that there was no significant change as digital services have gradually been introduced. Uh, monoliths and digital services have incidents at an unpredictable, yet um, not too scary rate. And on the right, we've got a time to restore uh, for the exact same instance in the exact same time period. And uh, red is the monoliths, blue is the digital services. If somebody's colorblind, then just uh, drop me a line in the chat window and I can chat um, about these numbers with you afterwards. Um, what we can see here is that the time to restore for digital services is substantially lower than monoliths. You heard me mention earlier about 43 minutes being a target time for 99.9 .9 and being a, you know, a nice to have for 99.0 you'll see that most of the time to restores here in blue are hovering around 43 minutes or uh, maybe up to or creeping up towards two hours. And the time for monoliths in 2018 to restore from a live incident was much longer, you know, up to four hours or more. And yet the trend lines here show that the time to restore is coming down for monoliths and digital services, which is really encouraging. Um, it's an interesting correlation. There's certainly been a lot of cross-pollination of knowledge and skills between digital services and monoliths. And there are some shared processes like major instant management. So there's been benefits delivered for both, which is really nice. All right, thank you. So this is my favorite table ever, I think. So this is all about service reliability again. And this is an analysis of the hybrid operating model that is used at John Lewis. Uh, this data is from uh, February 2019 to February 2020, so only one year, but it is encouraging. So the uh, top line is obviously the you build it, you run it operating model, which at the time was used for six digital services and four on call rotors. So, and the reason that that's not six and six is because as we said earlier, some services go into a shared product domain rotor and some services have no on call out of hours. So six and four is perfectly permissible. And the bottom line is the, is the third party managed service that was covering the free e-commerce monoliths that uh, made up the johnlewis.com website at the time or the majority of it. And what we can see here is that with you build it, you run it, daily deployments were achieved on average, which is seven times faster than the weekly deploys of the third party managed service. Um, I should say at Equal Experts, um, there's a shared consensus now that it's pretty much impossible to reach daily deployments with an ops run it model, unless ops completely let go of the deployment process because Nobody wants to have a cab on a daily basis. It's hard enough to do a cab weekly. If, you, if you're doing a cab weekly, then I, I salute you and I salute your change management folks. Um, in terms of major instance P1s and P2s, there were twice as many for the uh, monoliths. Uh, the handoff rate, that is the amount of incidents where the first responder wasn't the right person to fix it and had to be handed off to another team for a resolution. It was one and a half times lower with you build it, you run it. Often the product team engineer on call was the right person to solve the problem for that digital service. And on time to restore, it was three times faster for you build it, you run it. Again, hovering around that 43 minute target, which is lovely. And finally, revenue protection effectiveness. This was a measure where we were trying to find a, like a fair comparison in a way that folks can understand. Um, and revenue protection effectiveness is a the percentage of expected revenue loss per incident that you actually save with a fast time to restore. So let's say that we have a service 
that's uh, critical and it's a free nines availability 99.9 that means that your expected revenue loss on failure at most is 43 minutes and then we can put a pound sign on that because we know how much money per minute is flowing through that service if i have um an incident and it lasts for 10 minutes um then obviously we know that we've saved 33 minutes worth of money there and then when we look at that for all instance belonging to a particular operating model then we could see that you build it, you run it was three times higher in terms of effectiveness. So 65% of the time, the expected revenue loss from an instant was saved with a fast time to restore. Whereas with the third party managed service, it was minus 204%, like more money was lost than was expected to be lost. And there's also another table column that I'm not allowed to show. Uh, which is that um, the you bullet you run it rotors were cheaper <laughs> for that particular year. Um, but that's not a fair comparison for a bunch of different reasons. And Simon and I are now considering looking at more recent data for 2020 to 2021 as well. Uh, back to Simon. Thank you. So what does that kind of speed and agility allow us to do for our customers? I've picked one example here. This was actually pre-COVID-19. Well, this was our first beta trial on JohnLoose.com, where we wanted to improve the experience for choosing the right sofa. For an online retailer, it's not always easy to gather feedback from our customers, but we have the advantage of being able to tap into the vast experience of our shop selling partners. So after putting the first iteration live on the website, some of the team visited one of our shops to gather feedback. Now, our shop floor partners are used to most IT uh, projects being multi years to roll out a new e post till system. So they were absolutely amazed when they could see their feedback being implemented on the very same day live on the website. So they could really feel as though they were contributing not just to the shop, but to the e commerce experience as well. But on the right there, some of you may have seen recently in the news that Boris Johnson's partner has been re replacing all of Theresa May's. John Lewis Furniture and Decorations with their £800 rolls of gold wallpaper. So we're not going to please everybody. Um, so now we'll draw to a close and look at some of the challenges we're still working on. So how do we achieve that best, best value support model? So Steve talked about those domain rotors. Um, actually, in some ways, we're, we're a little bit too successful in getting teams to own and want to own and support their own service because they say, I don't want anybody else supporting my service. I want to support my own. So there's still a bit of influence in there to get that, that, that model fully uh, embedded. Uh, Steve touched on this as well. How do you safely reduce and remove the, the reliance on that 24 by seven eyes on managed service support model that we've been uh, used to over, over the many years? Uh, and we're still working on as we get rid of the final pieces of the, the, the monolith, how we completely wing ourselves off that. And of course, uh, for anybody kind of working in this space, always an ongoing challenge of evolving service management to become more agile. So we're spending a lot of time with um, colleagues in, in the enterprise uh, service management team to get them to understand what, uh, you know, what this is, what continuous integration, continuous delivery is and why a cab every two weeks doesn't add value anymore. So we're still working on that, but we're, we're making some uh, real inroads into that. We've recently automated the, the change process for all the deployees so we, um, we can be much more uh, agile with that. So finally, how do you embed operability at scale in a 150 year old enterprise organization? Well, what we'd recommend is test, learn, continually evolve your operating model. Think about operability as early as possible to ensure sustainability for continuous delivery. Maintain that visibility of operability with both leading and trailing indicators so you know you're keeping on track. Encourage little and often deployments where possible to increase the agility and reduce the blast radius of deployment issues or defects. And adopt, you build it, you run it for all the product teams to maximize their operability incentives and create cost effective insurance for the business outcomes. And just finally, uh, just a few links on this slide. Um, I'd like to uh, 
thank uh, you all for listening. Uh, thank you, Steve. Um, and uh, yeah, please uh, have a look at some of these links of uh, previous talks and articles and blogs brought by other members of the team and uh, by EE. So, and, and John Lewis and Partners is hiring, I believe, Simon. Uh, yes, yes, we, we are certainly <laughs> always, always on the lookout for good people. So, uh, yeah, there is a link there to our uh, recruitment website as well.